Hello everybody and welcome to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, The Wilder Historian, and today I have a very special account I want to share with you. It's probably my favorite account of what happened at Gettysburg during Pickett's Charge. It's actually taken from the Union perspective. This account comes from Thomas Galway of the 8th Ohio. It's so graphic you can almost see what he's describing, so I hope you enjoy. We stepped out of the ditch and moved up on the roadside bank. For a minute we saw nothing but the smoke of our skirmishers in the front. Then came a distant murmur from the front, followed by a renewal of our artillery, which had slackened for a few minutes. All at once the murmur increased into a prolonged yell. We saw the enemy with the colors flying, advancing in columns and mass to the left of where the barn had been burnt in the morning. I had often read of battles and of charges, had been in not a few myself, but until this moment I had not gazed upon so grand a sight as was presented by the beautiful mass of gray with its small square colors as it came on in serried array, cheering their particular cheer right towards the crest of the hill, which we and our batteries were to defend. We went forward to the fence line at a run. Now against us moved a large force of the enemy who were formed to the north of the column and mass. Later in the day I learned that the massed column was Pickett's division of Longstreet's corps. The troops north of them, who were assaulting us, were Pettigrew's and Pender's divisions of Hill's Corps. They were in two lines of battle, with their batteries in the intervals of the line, advancing at a gallop. Our artillery fire that now opened upon the advancing Confederates was such as nothing but the heroic could endure, and very anxiously, too, that beautiful, terrible mass coming towards our left shoulders. At its head was a mounted officer, who rode like a demigod and was worthy by his courage to lead those brave men who followed. We now heard the fearful din of the artillery, the savage, threatening yells of the advancing, and now seemingly invincible enemy, of the insulting taunts of the enemy's old skirmish line in our front, who had now risen to their feet and were pouring a destructive fire into us. We stood all alone, out in that open field, waving our colors. In spite of all the threatening advance, we took time to praise the valor of that Confederate officer who rode ahead a conspicuous mark for sixty cannon and thousands of muskets. A few seconds and a cheer rises to the west of us. Now Pender's line with colors flying issues from the trees that cover the crest of the low ridge to our front and comes right toward us. But from the first it was easy to see the difference between the metal of these men and those of Pickett's glorious column. Two or three times Pender's line hesitated, whether obliged to reform because of the irregularity of the ground or whether owing to a disposition to give way before the effect of our artillery shells exploding right in front of them. These bursts, which occasionally hid them in the smoke from us, were now actually tearing their ranks to pieces. The enemy came as far as the fence opposite us, where the Confederate skirmishers had been from the first of the battle, and here they lay down. Had they continued their advance with the same spirit shown by their comrades in Pickett's column, God knows how many days might have been added to this war. But down they lay, though only for a few minutes. We so galled them with our fire that a panic soon took hold of them, and they fled back to the low ridge. I must say something about the anomalous position of our regiment sent out to the Emmitsburg Pike to skirmish with the advance of the enemy's assaulting troops. We found ourselves a single regiment of less than 300 men, 200 yards in front of the main federal position. Seemingly forlorn position for us, but as it turned out, destined to play an unexpected vital part in the defense of the salient angle, which Meade's line of battle made just behind us. Pender's advance being so soon checked, every shot was turned on picket. On and on his column, the mounted officer still conspicuous at its head. From time to time, the smoke bursting shells would envelop them for a few seconds. But when the smoke lifted, the gray mass was still coming on, still compact, still orderly, ever and anon raising one of those piercing yelps which have been so terrifying for our new troops to hear. They have ascended the last slope and now have nothing between them and the crest of the heights but the blue-clad men who, at one part of the line, are behind a stone wall. Now they are almost at the pike. To the left of our regiment the blood goes fast through the veins now. The light of battle shines in the eye. The heart becomes, for the time, stilled goodness and mercy and all the softer emotions that, at other times, influence a man's actions are dormant. 
This is the moment and the circumstance of which poets have sung, which historians have narrated, which even painters have endeavored to depict, but which none can understand who have not seen, heard, or felt the crisis of a great battle. The enemy column has now approached the turnpike just to the south of us. They seem to pay no attention to us, who are a mere handful. Yet the fire which we pour into the left flank is a deadly one and tells visibly upon them. They are now over the turnpike and begin to ascend the rise of the stone wall. We have entirely recovered from the momentary doubt that had seized us, and with the fresh ammunition which a short time ago was issued us, play havoc with them. Still brave and cheering, they ascend the stone wall. Our men up there break and disappear beyond the crest of the ridge, which at this point is not as high as it is just behind us. For a few seconds, things look dubious. The enemy has taken Griffin's battery and beginning to train its guns on our own line. Then the nick of time Major Rorty of Hancock's staff rallying a portion of the 29th New York charges them and recovers the battery. The enemy now broken and disorganized and far from any support begin to retire. The retreat is at almost at once turned into a flight. From our position on their flank we and other troops off to the Confederate right have not ceased to pouring a devastating fire into their masses. Now at last they begin to melt. They had gained the crest of the ridge, almost had victory in their grasp, when now unfortunate men, they are forced to turn their charge into a disastrous flight. They threw away everything, cartridge boxes, waist belts, and haversacks in their stampede. We dashed in amongst them, taken prisoners by droves. One man of my company, a corporal, took fifteen prisoners, including two officers, as well as a stand of colors. As far as the eye could reach, the ground was covered with flying confederates. They all seemed to extend their arms in their flight, as if to assist their speed. From that time when the enemy signal gun was fired at ten minutes to one, until the moment when the magnificent troops of Pickett's column had disappeared over the low ridge, a mere mass of fugitives was about seventy minutes. Our own loss was severe. I myself was hit three times between the opening of the cannonade and the rout of the enemy. The first and second sergeants of my company each lost a leg. Old John Burke, who had served 21 years in the 18th Royal Irish of the British Army, before entering ours, also lost the use of a leg. Levier, who was an old French sailor, was also crippled in the leg. Wilson was killed outright, as was Corporal Barney Maguire, a brave, humorous fellow. Private William Brown died before dark. Out of the 216 men that our regiment took into battle, we lost 103 in killed and severely wounded. As for the slightly wounded, almost every man was hit. In other words, we suffered nearly 100% casualties. As Pickett's column was running, we dashed in amongst them, and our 150 men captured about the same number of prisoners. When we reached the ditch of the Emmitsburg Pike on our way back, we beheld a sorry sight. Many of the wounded had been carried back to it during the fight. Others had hobbled and crawled into it, some dying after reaching it. It was full of pools of blood, and the grass for some distance in front was saturated with blood. In the ditch, along with many others in like condition, lay two of our sergeants, Fairchild and Kelly, each of the lower part of the leg hanging by a piece of flesh to the rest of the limb. This brought the tears to my eyes, for they were both good, brave soldiers and favorites with everyone. I hope you enjoyed this account, and like me, think it's one of the best accounts because you can truly visualize what's happening to this young private in the Union Army. So, until next time, have a great day.